Figure we play with some vintage carburetors here today on this episode from Motorist OLLC. Hey everybody, um, for your first time here, my name's Tom, it's Motorist OLLC here in Bradenton, Florida. We're going to take a look at some vintage McKinney carburetors. Uh, and I'm going to go over some basics on these things. I'm not going to go into a full teardown and repair video um, because it's kind of difficult to do, especially when I'm not up, not up to that stage yet in this particular job. And I'm not even sure if a customer is going to be using these carbs. These are actually off of the Z1R bike project that I've been working on. And uh, the customer has indicated I think he wants to go with some McKinney flat slides on it. But these have been sitting around. And they're fairly clean, so I thought it'd be a good, um, you know, sample or example to go over the things I look at, look for when I first take a vintage bike apart uh, that has certain modifications that are obvious, because these carburetors may not necessarily be the OEM ones. And if we're going to start ordering parts, we really need to know what we're looking at. So let's go ahead and get right into it. All right. So when I take these carbs off the bike, first thing I want to do is give them an overall look see. I want to see if anything jumps out at me, like there's some missing parts. How do they overall look? Are they really cruddy? Are they damaged? Is there any broken pieces? Things like that, because you don't want to really get into a rack of carbs like this that's really not salvageable, or it's got some cracks, like for example, right in one of the the actual carb bodies, or there's a, or there's a crack actually off of the intake side of the carb, or a chip or something. The, the actual bodies may be more difficult and more cost prohibitive to replace individually. Like, for example, this would, of course, be one, two, three, four in this orientation because this is your intake side uh, as far as the air box goes, if it had an air box. And this is the bike side up here, the engine side. And so, you know, I'm going to look at them and say, well, if I need a number two or a number three carb body because they are going to be different because of their orientation, may not be salvageable or worth salvaging because I got a broken, because there's like a broken gusset or something here, you know, something on the carburetor doesn't look right or it just does, makes them null, you know, something not usable. So I get my look-see over. This is obviously in very good shape. This is as removed from the bike. I haven't done anything to it. These came off the engine and went on the shelf until this, today, right now. The other thing I look for is I look to see if there's any marred fasteners. What I want to know is whether or not somebody's been in them, and you can kind of tell whether they did it sloppily, whether the carbs have been unracked, and what I mean by that is whether they've been taken off of their mounting uh, plate. In this case, we call it a rack, so have they been unracked. Now, the first thing I see right now is if you look right there, um, there is definitely some rounding off of these. Um, there's definitely some rounding off of these JIS, uh, like Phillips type screws. So somebody's had these unracked, but right off the bat, I can tell you that they did anyway, because if you go to this side and you take a look at the fuel tees, which are tight, I'm not going to move them right now, but if you look at these fuel tees right here, these are aluminum fuel tees. These are aftermarket, there's no question about it. Uh, they may have come with some sort of a metal fuel tee, I don't know, but they wouldn't have looked like this. Um, so these are aftermarket. Somebody split this rack probably because there was a leak in one or both of these fuel tees. This is the one between 1 and 2, and this is the one between 3 and 4. Uh, the KZ-1000s, the early ones, and of course the Z1R uses a fuel cock that has two hose outlets. So one goes to two carburetors, the other goes to the other two. Uh, so in other words, in other carburetor setups, you will have one fuel tee in the middle here and then just connectors there and there. And so you run, you run a common fuel rail, but in this case, we have two separate ones. The other thing I look for is how does it just look like it's been put together? And this is um, looking pretty good. looks like somebody's either cleaned or replaced the spring here. Uh, the actual car bodies may have been um, vapor blasted at one time. Uh, the aluminum caps are not, you know, screwed up. They're not corroded. They're not anything like that. Nothing's really frozen. Uh, you know, as far as these go, these, you know, these can be unfrozen pretty easily by putting some silicone spray on them and starting to work them. But I don't want to do that right now because I'm not sure what we're going to do with these this rack yet. The other thing we want to do is we want to um, do an identification of actually what these carbs are. 
Now, obviously they're carburetors, and obviously it's for an inline four, and they're obviously McKinney's, but we need to know if they're the proper ones for this particular engine. The reason why, of course, is when you go into a service fish, a parts fish, I should say, and you are going to order parts for it, you're going to be going off of the bike year, make, and model. You're not going to necessarily be ordering parts out of a parts fish for a specific uh, carburetor you know, assembly. Uh, you need to you need to start somewhere. You need to start with the make, model, and year of the, of the uh, motorcycle you're working on. Now, finding the numbers on these can be quite difficult. Once you do it a few times, you get to know essentially where they like to hide them. Often they will be right here on the ends, which this is not the case, but they'll be a very light stamping right here on this edge where the where the float bowl meets the actual car body. I know from experience that generally McKinney likes to put them right in there, and this one is kind of hard to see, but I can get you in where you can. I'm going to set you up here where you can actually see what I'm seeing. All right, so let me show you where I'm looking at. What I'm going to be looking at is that spot right there. You could probably do one of those two or even that one over there because I can see a faint number, which is on, when we're looking at the back of the carbs, the left side of that front flange that mounts up to the actual plate that the carburetors are mounted up to, or the rack as I like to call it. So let's zoom up on that spot and we'll see what that number is. You probably are going to need a... Uh, a magnifying glass. I've already looked at this, but you can see it. It's upside down, but you can see it says Z12 and then 00, zero after it. I don't see any other numbers there. So that's what we're going to go with. So you write that down and then start doing your drilling. And I'll explain what I mean by that here in a sec. So by drilling down, the first thing I do is I go to the service manual. I'm in the supplement section because that's what covers the D1, which is the Z1R. Otherwise, this book is essentially about the base KZ-1000, and uh, that's fine too. But, uh, you know, I take a look at it, and according to the, uh, you know, to the service manual, we're looking at a VM-28 as far as the carburetors go, and that doesn't really jive to that uh, Z-1200. Uh, there's really no reference to it. Some service manuals do have that, and they identify it by the number on the carburetor, but I rarely have ever seen that with uh, Kawasaki, at least, especially these old ones. Uh, and so what I did was I went into the Google and I put in the Z1200 and I found a bunch of hits that it's actually a VM26. It would be typical to a 76 to 77 KZ9 or Z1 900cc. And the early um, KZ1000s had uh, the same carburetors. So it makes very much sense that that would be the case. VM26s. So the KZ1000A2, which would be in 78, but the uh, the early 1000s, uh, which, you know, started in 77, essentially, uh, they were built in late 76, and for the 77 model year, um, had these the same carbs, pretty much the same thing right there. They, I bet you they are exactly the same. And that's not unusual that guys in performance mods will actually take and put the Z1 carbs in. Um, I can't really explain too lengthy to explain why. There's, there's a bunch of stuff I read as far as why they like these carburetors better than the um, other ones, but it has a lot to do with the uh, fuel flow and the atomization and the um, actual fuel coming through as far as being uh, the turbulence of the fuel and better performance on the low end, things like that. But what I ended up doing also is I measured the bore of the carburetor on the intake side. Um, on these particular ones, I think it's best to go up if you stick your finger and you can feel that there's a ridge inside there which is really the true diameter of the bore out here it's a little bit bigger sometimes they can even be a little tapered that'll throw you off so i go in there with a spring gauge this guy right here and i stick it in there and get a good feel and then i measure it up and these are indeed 26 millimeter so what we're dealing with here is actually the vm26s and what's important about that is again now that we know the carburetors and now we know the application if we're going to go by parts, uh, we're going to look for a KZ1000A2, and we can match up the um, parts from that one. Also, visually, taking a look at the parts online and, and our carburetors, make sure that, you know, the bowl gaskets and stuff are the same. And this is where we can start, at least, all right? So, basically, that's how I do that, and that's how we drill down. So, again, I'm confident that these are the VM26s. I'm going to start with the top of the carburetor here, and I'm, what essentially I'm going to do is I'm going to pull one top off and then one float bowl off uh, this top cap on the float bowl on the bottom 
and we'll discuss certain features of these round slide carbs and and uh, then I'll get into some jetting stuff when I get to the to the float bowl the business side of it where the fuel lives so first thing I want to go over is um, again I don't want to suggest that this is unracking but this is up here structurally part of the you know the feature that holds the carburetor together obviously this is okay to take off because the main part that holds it together is that plate in the back so we're going to get this off and just take let's see this would be number four we're going to take number four top off and then we'll um, take a look at it from there but i'm going to have to get this plate off out of the way because this lives on top of that so while i'm doing that i want to talk about the um, fasteners here i think i don't know if i mentioned it before i'm kind of doing this uh, video in different segments so sorry apologize if i don't remember what i've already shot but yeah, um, these are jis screws and uh, that means Japanese Industrial Standard. And the thing about JIS screws, once you can grab it, which I can't get that one right now because it's underneath that. This is the idle adjustment or the curb idle adjustment knob. It's just basically a stop where the throttle comes back. Um, when you look at these screws, you can see that there is a small dot in them. And that dot right there, it's kind of facing the bottom of the screw head right now. It's on the bottom of the screw head, clocked at about 6 o'clock. Um, that indicates a JIS screw. Now, not all, not all of them have that, but if it's a Japanese bike, or even anything Chinese now for that matter, it's a good possibility it has JIS screws. And it uh, really takes a different screwdriver. This looks like your garden variety Phillips, but it's not. Um, the, you can look on YouTube and find a dozen or dozen hundred <laughs> videos on what the difference is between a JIS and regular Phillips. And these are vessel uh, tools. I'm, I don't know if anybody else other than them makes the hand tools for it. I don't know. But uh, anyway, we're going to get this off and all the way. Um, whenever you're taking a carb rack apart or even individual carbs on the rack, not even unracking it, organization is key. I just have a small plastic container right here that's like for, I think batteries came in at one time. Uh, that's not big enough to do the entire thing. What I would recommend you do is go out to, next time you're at the grocery store, pick up a, um, just a regular garden variety silverware tray. And the silverware tray generally has four, uh, you know, long, you know, compartments, if you will, and then one or two across uh you know, bigger ones, like for your spoons or big spoons or something. That works really well. And what I do is I take it and I number it one, two, three, four with a uh, magic marker. And then I take the carbs apart in order and put all the parts for one into that side and, you know, and so forth. That's really handy to do. And they're really cheap and, you know, inexpensive wise. And man, you can, um, you can really keep things organized that way. Uh, then set it aside while you're waiting on stuff to come in and, and just as long as you don't knock the thing over and everything goes across the floor Then you're just fine. You can also buy these replacement screws if you need to um, uh, Like for example Z1 Enterprises you can go on there and buy bags of them I have a bunch of bags of like 25 screws for all different size, you know four millimeter five millimeter the whole bit So I, I'll ha I have new screws where I can put these in if I need to Pop one of the caps off. Now on these round slides, you're gonna have a gasket. Um, we're gonna carefully get that out of the way. And look at this gasket, it's like brand new. So somebody has definitely been in these carbs, which is good, there's nothing wrong with that. What I wanna talk about is what's underneath there though. Now on these um, particular round slides, as opposed to a, you know, a CV constant velocity carburetor, slides are act actuated manually. So here's an example of that happening. So you have a pivot, right here your um, your actual slide is right below that and then this thing just goes up and down based on whatever throttle position that you're particularly in now if you take a look at this part of it which is the intake side on number four you can see the slide go up and down the needle pulls out of the emulsion tube and uh, allows you know, the metering of fuel coming up through there from the main jet but also you do get a certain amount of um, influence, if you will, from the slow jet as well as the main jet. 
through a lot of the actual throttle range. You do get a certain amount of influence depending on jetting and depending on some other stuff. And I'll try to cover that more when we actually get into the bottom of the carburetor. The reason why I want to show you this is not only the action of it and how it works, but how it's adjusted. Um, as opposed to a CV carb that has the butterflies on the intake side of the carb, so these will be right here, and then the throttle actually opens them, and then through a certain amount of vacuum dynamics, it actually has a diaphragm that raises the slide up and down against a very light spring. Uh, these, you know, are mechanical, of course, and this is how you adjust them. On the top of the carburetor here, you will see that you have a stem and nut, just like certain, some valves are like that on motorcycles that aren't shim motors. Simply break that nut, it's an eight millimeter uh, nut, and then you just use a regular screwdriver. And what you do is, once the motorcycle's running, of course, and you're at idle and all these are off, you break them all loose and you adjust this up and down. So when you turn this, you're actually raising or lowering the slide in relation to the other slides. On constant velocity carburetors, one of the carburetors is going to be a base carburetor. In other words, it's unadjustable. There's no adjustment on the actual um, uh, part where the screw would go against that particular part of the throttle um, that controls that particular butterfly. Uh, so, in other words, instead of a butterfly, of course, we have a slide. So, if you picture that this would be like a butterfly, uh, they all stop at a certain point. So does those butterflies, and these have to be even. And if you measured them, it still wouldn't be right because there's variances in, in airflow depending on the engine and so forth between cylinders. But in this case, we're just going to adjust each individual one so they're all level. Now, there is a procedure for it, but again, all I do is I find one of the four that's closest to what the service manual says that it's supposed to be as far as pulling vacuum. I think that's in um, millimeters or mercury, inches of water, I can't remember which. And then adjust them all to that one, basically. So if they're all way off, then you just bring one in and adjust the other three. So it's pretty simple. And then you just lock that back down, retest. And, you know, of course, you want to hold this while you lock it down. It's really, really easy to do these. It isn't hard at all. Uh, as opposed to the CV carbs, that sometimes it's virtually impossible, almost impossible to get at the adjustment screws. I wish I had one out to show you, but unfortunately, I do not. So that's just the top of this, which is the, uh, you know, that's pretty simple. Now, if you're unracking these things, it gets more complicated. It isn't simple because all this stuff has to come off. The, the main rot shaft that rotates everything has got to come out. These have to be slid off there. It can, there's, there's gonna, definitely going to be some, some uh, either some, um, you know, plastic washers or some sort of spacers in here uh, that may be made out of nylon or something. And, and you got to get that stuff back in exactly where it comes out of. So take pictures if you're going to take it apart. But again, if you don't have to unrack the carbs, just don't. Because it's not worth it. It really isn't. There's a lot to these as far as unracking them. So again, all four about the same. And, you know, again, here's your throttle actuation, your return spring. And this is for your curb idle there. It just stops that from coming back anymore. So when you adjust this, you're essentially adjusting where the uh, slide is resting at, uh, you know, at the spring tension, it pulls it back and that's it. Pretty simple stuff. Now the synchronization of these, I mentioned that before, is really, really important for good running motorcycle. In fact, it's, it's just not good for the engine to have one carburetor that has a slight imbalance between the other one, because remember that imbalance is going to be carried all through the range. You synchronize at idle, because it's a known point. It's a known point. The throttle is closed and you synchronize it so so the vacuum is the same between all four carburetors. You couldn't really do it at higher throttles anyway because the vacuum is low when the throttle is open. So when you're in this position the vacuum is actually very high because the intake pulse has to be sucked through a very small uh, space right here which is called the cutaway of the slide. So when you open this up there's much less vacuum because now you have a big hole and the air comes through much more easily. So in that case, you, you're just not going to be able to do it. So we, we do it at um, idle where the vacuum is highest. And yes, if you have all four of these off, technically that could introduce a vacuum leak um, into the, the each carburetor. But remember, all four of them are off. So it'll be essentially an equal 
um, representation between the carburetors, even if it is sucking a little bit in through the top, um, because it's going to be the same. The whole point is just to get everything the same and then not and get a baseline that you put it to, and that's that's how you get that baseline. So remember, this would be high vacuum, a little bit of space, and there's your your cutaway of the slide. And then when you open it up, the vacuum goes much lower. So that's why we do it that way, and it works out really well. Okay, now I have them upside down and uh, to the relative position I was in at least. And I'm going to go do another reach around with you here. And this time we're going to do number four. Remember, they're upside down, so they would go this way. And this is to the front. So now that's one, two, three, and four. And this is just easier to see in the uh, camera view. So I'm going to go ahead and pop a float bowl off. We're going to discuss some of the stuff inside there and talk about some of the jetting dynamics when it comes to getting these things to run right with modifications. There's really no set, you know, rules for it. Uh, back in the day, you know, when I first started doing this on, I bought a brand new KZ650 actually, and uh, I took the thing and promptly um, pulled the carbs off, jetted it, and put uh, pods on it and uh, air pods that is, intake pods, and put a Kirker 4 into one header on it. And it took me about a month of dabbling in between, you know, back then, of course, working a regular job, early 80s. I, uh, I spent about a month getting the thing dialed in because there was no guidelines or nothing, of course, no internet to look up any of that stuff. Uh, you talk to mechanics, talk to shops, and get an idea what you're doing, and that's what I ended up doing. Nowadays, you can usually go on like Dynajet or another website and get a kit for it, and it makes it a heck of a lot easier. But even then, there can be some, some things that you got to kind of know and understand. All right, so again, we are number four. So here's your float. This would be your main jet, and you can tell that, of course, because it's right in the middle, and that's where the needle sticks down uh, off of the slides. And, of course, this would be your slow jet. Sometimes there's a third jet. That's your enricher jet. This particular carb doesn't utilize that. But let's go ahead and figure out how that works. Um, right now, there's really not a jet, but there is this little standoff here. You see this guy? This is where the fuel gets picked up for, I guess you'd call it a jet, but this is where it gets picked up for the enricher, this one right there. And what that does is it lines up with a spot in the float bowl, which is this spot here and you can see it fills up like a column it'll be a column of fuel in there that is really a little tiny jet in there as well and so when the float bowl fills up it'll go through that little hole assuming it's not blocked off this is a real common thing to overlook and then the thing won't start cold and so you want to make sure these are clean it fills this little column up this is immersed in the column and then this little pickup i guess it would be called it like a jet pickup Picks up the fuel when that enricher plunger is open, and again, through certain vacuum dynamics, it sucks it up through there and enriches the mixture. We're not going to mess with that now. We're going to talk about the main and the slow jets. First thing we do when we look at the main jets is actually a glance at the service manual is probably a good idea because <clears throat> there are certain bikes, uh, the ZX7s, newer ones of course, and some of the V-Twins and some of the V4s even have different jet sizes for like for example the middle cylinders because they realize they get hot hotter and so they richen them up a little bit but generally speaking these inline fours you're going to find that all four are the same size so what we're going to do is we're going to take a magnifying glass and take a look and what we have in there is uh one twelve and a half one one two point five one one two point five now McKinney versus like Cahin carburetors, they use a different um, system for identifying their jet sizes. Like for example, I think it's the Cahins, you know, typically used on a lot of Hondas and stuff. They actually use a size that is an actual dimension. And I have a chart for it uh, somewhere, but I don't have it in front of me. But as opposed to the McKinney's, that they use a, uh, basically it's a formula to calculate uh, CFM or certain amount of fuel flow through the jet. So in other words, a 112 and a half McKinney and a 112 and a half, if there was a matching one in Cahin, would absolutely not be the same size. So you just got to keep that in mind. And the threads are likely different too. So when you order these things and you're getting a jet kit for it or you're individually purchasing jets, 
Uh, you can go on websites. I like to use Niche, niche Cycle, N-I-C-H-E, in St. Petersburg, Florida. They're very, very good about identifying all of their different jets with um, uh, with what carburetors they go to and so forth. So we're going to go ahead and pop. We're going to try to pop this out without holding this, but sometimes they'll come out. It doesn't matter if the Emulsion 2 comes out with it or not. That's the next piece we were going to talk about anyway. So right here is our Emulsion tube. It's essentially a distribution point for the fuel off of the main jet, and it's engineered to do it a certain amount of uh, things in there in regards to how the fuel is distributed inside to go when the needle opens up. And I, I, I'm i not a, you know, a fuel engineer, so I can't tell you what that is. But essentially, this is just a really critical part. And on a lot of small bikes, uh, little single cylinders and stuff, I'll just replace all this stuff straight off because, you know, they're so critical to fuel, you know, to function in a stock, you know, lean setup, you know, EPA engine. That I just throw new ones in. But these old ones you can generally reuse, uh, make sure that they're clean. And you can see this one's really clean. You can look through it, and it's a nice looking jet. I'm going to talk a little bit more about jets here in a second. Let's go ahead and get the pilot one out or the slow jet. These slow jets are notorious for seizing up, and it's really easy to break them when you put them in and snap them off. So be very careful. If you're taking an old one apart, and it doesn't want to go, get some penetrating oil on it, work it back and forth, and be very careful with it. The other thing I look at on jets when I take them apart is whether or not the slot is all gnarly or anything. This one is actually in pretty good shape too. It looks pretty new. Uh, I would say this is an aftermarket jet, just the way it looks. And I don't mean by aftermarket, uh, you know, OEM, you know, you bought it from an aftermarket source. I mean, it's non-OEM and it's probably like just a, you know, a jet purchase from a place like Niche Cycle. These are 17 and a half, 17.5. So what I want to do right now is I want to look at that um, service manual, although I don't have the VM28s in here, I have the VM26s, but they list the VM26s. And I want to see what the jetting is in compared to the service manual on a VM26, because it'll tell you that generally. All right, so according to the KZ-1000A2 with a VM26, it's supposed to be 105 for a main jet and 15 for a slow jet. So these, of course, are bigger because it's been modified. And those numbers sound right to me, the numbers that we have in here. Uh, what was that main jet? It was 112.5, and, and this is 17.5. Those sound about right for even a mildly built-up uh, KZ-1000 motor. Uh, with um, these type of carbs and like air pods, individual air pods, and uh, a low flow exhaust. It sounds right just from my experience. That's probably good jetting for this. Now speaking of jetting, one of the probably the most misunderstood parts of these older carbs that are the, sl the round slide carbs and flat slide carbs, whether they're you know newer models of an older design or not, is the air screw right here and I call it an air screw because that's what it is it is not a fuel screw it is definitely for adjusting your slow or low uh, RPMs and idle and so forth and low throttle or, or just off the throttle type thing but these are air screws and we can always tell that because a screw like this being back closer to the air inlet is an air screw. If you've got one underneath here, like on a more modern CV carbon, you can see that there is a spot for one of them right there. That'd be a fuel screw. So when this one gets, for example, opened up, if this was uh, the fuel screw used in this carb, you'd be enriching that particular mixture stream at that slice in RPM, I should say, and let's say idle, and on this one, if you open this up, you are letting more air in and you're actually making it a little leaner. So now that can be a little different depending on the setup because the more air that goes through here, um, the more fuel that gets picked up by both the slow and the main jet because of the airflow. And so sometimes you can get a little bit of a, uh, an opposite effect by opening this thing up thinking it's going to lean out, but it actually gets a little rich at first because you are increasing the airflow, and so it's going to pick up some more fuel as well. So you just have to remember that this is an air screw, 
and keep that in mind when you dial in your, um, uh, your, your settings. It is not uncommon for these things to be set at like three quarters of a turn to one turn, whereas a fuel screw might be anywhere from two and a half, two and three quarters, to even four turns open in a performance setup. Let's see what this one is at right now. Half, one, one and a half. So that's one and a half. That's actually quite a bit for this one that I found in the past, but it could be right. Half, one, one and a half. So it's not uncommon for them to be open just a little bit. It really all depends on what the jetting is and how this thing is set up from, you know, for the kit that's in it or how it's been tuned, how well the engine is, valve clearances, you know, the compression, the whole bit. It all plays a role in this when you're setting up for, you know, performance and jetting and things like that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, how we would go about determining jetting changes that need to be made. Uh, and again, that's kind of a subjective thing, almost, you know, voodoo science, but really it's, it can be, it's something you got to learn almost by feel. Uh, once you do it a bunch of times, you kind of get a feel for it. And what I have found is the number one critical thing for tuning, especially these carburetors, is the fuel level in the carburetors themselves, or otherwise known as the float level. The float level controls the fuel level. How these are done, and I can guarantee if you looked in the service manual, it would tell you there may be a float level, uh, you know, setting that you would set it by measuring, but almost exclusively these have a service fuel level. And when you have a service fuel level, what you end up doing is you have to put these things level in a rack or if they're on a motor they're kind of hard to do when they're attached to an engine but i do them on a rack like this one right here i do them on a rack like this one right here and uh, we level them out and then with the carburetors of course upright what we end up doing is we end up measuring the fuel level uh, on the side of the carburetor by looking at it through a clear tube from the bottom of the float so i have a, actually a little tool you can buy these uh, I imagine uh, uh, Kawasaki lists an OEM for it, but I have a little tool that's made out of a jet. And this is the drain. This is actually an overflow. This is a really good thing to have on these. I'll cover that here in a second. But what you end up having here is the main drain. You take that main drain out when there's no fuel and you put your little tool in. And then with the carburetor's level, you hit the carburetors with fuel. And then the, you, put the, um, uh, you put the clear tube alongside of here and it'll tell you how much it's supposed to be at, above, or below, usually below the edge of the carburetor where this thing sits. So you can kind of see that edge right there where this thing's been sitting like a witness mark. It'll probably be about a millimeter below, which is about right there, maybe a little bit above this feature of the actual float bowl. It is really critical before you tune any of these carburetors to have the float levels correct because it just won't work right unless they are. It is real sensitive to that. So when we do the flow levels and we make sure that the fuel and flow level is good, then we can turn our attention to actually dialing in the jetting. Again, that's really, really important. You will end up chasing your tail, uh, you know, seven days a week and twice on Tuesday um, if you don't get your fuel levels set perfectly. they got to be as close as possible. Next thing that I do when I'm tuning one of these engines is I don't look at the carburetors. I want to look at the spark plugs. Uh, you want to take it for a decent ride get a little bit of um, heat into it, different throttle positions, bring it back, and once it's cool enough and safe enough, pull the plugs and take a look at them. Plugs are going to tell you a lot. If it's running hot, especially, it's going to tell you a lot. If the plugs are super light, like they're super lean, that tells you a lot. And, of course, if they're all carbonized and uh, looking fouled, that tells you, again, a lot right there. And it gives you an idea which direction to go in. So the spark plugs are really the place to look when you're going to tune these things. If you do it just by, well, it sounds like it's lean or it's got some, some uh, you know, fuel, excessive fuel, you know, being combusted. I can see it out the exhaust pipe. Well, if it's a performance setup, it's probably going to do that anyway. They're, they're usually set up to run slightly on the rich side uh, because of their performance setup, higher compression, things like that, than on the lean side, but not always. So... What we end up doing is what I do is I take and I look at the existing jet number. And I want to think about this and say, do I actually, if it even seems like it's running 
um, a little bit on the uh, rich side. Um, do I really want to go all that lean or do I want to change the slow jet? Now, the slow jet plays an important role in, uh, you know, engine carburetor mixture on each carburetor uh, up, up until about when the thing is better than almost full throttle. You know, there's a there's a school of thought out there and you see all the different publications and drawings where the slow jet only really takes effect when it's um, when it's at, uh, you know, about up to quarter throttle and then it's like almost like a switch. Right. And then it goes to the main. That is not the case, especially in these performance setups. You got a lot of air, more airflow through there and you're going to get some some increased. Uh, you're going to get some additional rather fuel um, in, enhancement or fuel impact through the slow circuit as well as the main circuit, even at higher throttle. Probably not wide open, but certainly in mid and three quarter throttle, you got to consider this. So if this slow jet was exceptionally large, like let's say it was a, you know, a 19 or a 21 or something, I'd immediately go, that's too big for this. I would put that down to just a little bit over what the stock shows, which was what, a 15? And this is 17 and a half, so I'd probably put a 17 and a half in it. There's a drawing on the same page that I referred to before in regards to looking up the types of carbs that's pretty helpful in explaining the slow jet and the air jet and so forth function. And I wanted to show you this and discuss it real quick. Number one being the air screw, of course, and there we are right there. Now, if you look at the circuit, let me get a pointer here. If you look at the circuit, there's your air screw. There's your, on the back of the intake side of the carburetor, um, there is, of course, that... Uh, there's that air jet that hooks up with that circuit and it goes down through down to the pilot jet itself or the slow jet through that circuit. And then that gets mixed with the there and gets mixed with the fuel, of course, gets pulled up at proper metering based on that uh, size of that jet. And then up into the actual front or just a, probably right at or just in front of the, uh, the actual slide. This would be representative of the slide. This would be the slide cutaway. So, you know, again, Yes, at the higher vacuum at idle, you do have more impact of your of your pilot or slow system. But you can see that it's actually pulling fuel up through this um, this orifice or this particular circuit um, through a venturi effect. So when the air passes through, of course, with this narrow space here, that velocity is much higher. And yes, it's going to pull that more fuel through, but even when this slide is up higher, at higher RPMs, higher throttle positions, or I should say greater throttle positions, where the main jets are really starting to kick in more, you are going to get some impact of the slow jet in with the mix. This is engineered in there. So it's not like a switch where as soon as you crack the throttle past a certain point, this shuts off. That's not the case. So you can absolutely have a certain amount of impact of the slow jet on the almost the entire range of throttle and you got to remember that when you're jetting these things because if you have an overly rich mixture and you drop down a main jet and even at higher throttles it still seems to be a little bit rich it's probably because your pilot jet is too big and so it, it's just one of these things that when you have more airflow going through and you have a performance engine, perhaps it's got a really pretty significant intake charge because it's got higher compression and or it's a bigger, you know, bigger bore or something like that. And then the engine is sound in regards to valve clearances and stuff. This can pull a good intake charge through, which will, um, you know, again, impact this at a variety of even more open or higher throttle positions. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're jetting these things. And then on the main jet, I would look and see what the size that is, being 112 and a half. If it's running really rich, uh, I may want to consider other sources. Again, the float level, if I haven't already done that, to make sure it's not too high. And then take a look at, you know, the valve clearances, the timing of the engine of these old ones, especially if it's a point motor. And take a look at other things like that. Make sure the spark plugs are, like, good or brand new. And even a brand new plug can be shit, of course. But... Then I'd look at this and go, okay, I want to, it's running a little bit, um, you know, lean. I want to richen it up. So what I do is I go online and what I'll end up doing is if I have a 17 and a half in the pilot and I have a, our slow jet and I have a one, a one twelve and a half in the main, 
I generally order one size times four lower and then one or two sizes times four higher. So I'd end up getting about 12 jets um, for the mains and I'd get another maybe eight jets for the slows. And I would go whichever direction I needed to go in, uh, higher or lower on the slow jets. And then I'd have those in stock and then I'd start thinking about how I'm going to actually do that. And this is where the trial and error comes in. There's really no science to it. And you try the different jet packages that you want to set up and then see, see if, it, if it helps. But again, I cannot overemphasize. You have to know where you're at starting a baseline before you screw with any of this jetting. Uh, if you have a bike you're working on, your own bike, customer's bike, whatever, and it just ain't running right, and it's a little bit of a performance modification, like a different rack, or, you know, again, it has the AirPods, low-flow exhaust. You have to know where you're at. you got to rule everything else out first. Do a compression test across all four cylinders. Make sure you got good compression. Check the service flow, fuel level or flow levels, whatever, you know, the service manual says to do on that rack. Again, I know this one's going to be a service fuel level. Make sure that the fuel level on those carbs is as close to perfect as possible. Make sure they are spotlessly clean inside. This would be unacceptable even with a little bit of, you know, green dried snot on here. We would not do that. Um, on these carburetors, it's a little more difficult to check your needle setting, your needle heights, because they are adjustable with an E-clip. I can't show you that right now, but the slides, actually I can sort of. If you look inside here, you can see the needle sticking down from the bottom of the slide. So what holds that needle in from falling through? Well, there's an actual retainer clip that keeps it from going upwards, and there's an E-clip. It's a little spring clip, essentially. They call it an E-clip because if you look at it from you know top, it looks like an E. Or maybe a three, I don't know. And <laughs> and so you take that E clip and you can move that up and down along these little ribs that are cut into the uh, that are machined into the actual uh, the actual needle. And so it's kind of hard to check that, but you want to make sure that all these are set up the same. But you can sort of do that right now if you took all the main jets and all the emulsion tubes out. These guys, you can see whether or not that these are set wrong. It's you know it's possible somebody put one or two of them in wrong when they put them back. And, and the heights are incorrect. Now that would be another thing that I would deal with but a little bit later on. I'd get the low and mid-range first by, you know, for how's my throttle snap, um, how's the takeoff when it, and of course the engine was warmed up and I kind of quickly roll the throttle. Is it hesitating? Is it blowing some black fuel smoke out the back? Um, is it idling okay? Does it sound like it's hunting or a little bit of uh, it's not quite right on the idle because it's either too lean, probably too lean in that case, or it's too rich. Look at the spark plugs. I, then I'd start messing with the needles because at that point you can really kind of fine tune it in with the needles. Now as far as the air screw goes, again, we're going to play with that right here um, as we go along in our tuning. Um, I generally would start with about a half a turn and then work my way either out or I've had them where I've had only a quarter turn and it's run perfect depending on the jetting and depending on the setup it's just a matter of what you have because everything's you know variable when it comes to these things but you have to kind of feel it through but you got to know again where you're starting from that's probably the important lesson in this entire video is you cannot take anything for granted on these you have to know your baseline and where you're starting from. Okay, well that's about it. Um, that's about all I can share on this video about these carburetors. There's a lot more to it and it's just it would be difficult for me to really put it all in one video. I'd have to do individual videos when I get to a certain stage in this and that may be really problematic for me to do, especially if I got to get a job out. Again, these carburetors are probably not going back on that Z1R. The customer I think wants to put some flat slides on it. So we're probably just going to set these aside again for a while. But it was fun going through them. I hope you learned something from it. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the parts availability side of it, um, um, I would recommend uh, if you were going to do anything as far as picking up parts for these, um, you can try Z1 Enterprises. They're right up the road in Tampa. Um, let's see, Z1 
bikes, I think it's called Z1.net. They're out in California. They're very good about that kind of stuff. Uh, I mentioned Niche Cycle in St. Petersburg. I have no affiliation with any of these places. I'm just telling you where I've been able to find stuff. Uh, you can also find a lot of OEM jets uh, right in the parts fishes for these particular things because remember they've been used on, you know, certain jets have been used on probably a billion different carburetors. So the good, there's a good chance that you're going to actually have OEM jets if you want to pick them up. Uh, but, you know, the aftermarkets are just fine. I recommend shotgunning all the jets when you're going to do something like this. Uh, it's not even worth cleaning them anymore, especially if they're crusty. But even if they are crusty or moderately crusty and you think you can clean them, chances are you're not going to get them right. There could be a little bit of scale still inside the little opening, the actual orifice of the jet. And, it's, and it, you know, all these things add up to performance issues. So, if, again, if you know where you're starting from, you know where you're at when you replace all the jets, you know they're all brand new, um, you know where your engine is as far as compression, you know where your valves are as far as valve clearance, uh, because you're not going to really be able to sync the carbs up properly without a valve clearance check anyway. So we want to get all that stuff baseline done, then we fiddle with the carbs, and I guarantee you're going to be able to get it tuned just fine. So I hope you enjoyed again, and we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks for watching.